Hello, everyone. Welcome to your BC 2030 Week 4 live chat lecture, as well as the breaking down coding cases for um, with Chapter 13. But the breaking cases is going to be referencing to how to code for the medicine section, as well as how to code for HCPCS coding. This particular lecture or the PowerPoint that I have here that I'm going to do initially is based out of Chapter 13 of the Step-by-Step. -step. And um, this is basically focusing on Level 2 HCPCS coding. I have not included any information in here for basic CPT coding because this presentation is going to be a bit lengthy because I'm going to deal with the assessment for this week. So break some of those coding cases. Now what I want you guys to know before I even get started is that every week in your weekly materials under reading materials in the classroom, you should be able to download a copy of your weekly assessment. And so what you're going to need to do once I get to that portion is make sure you have a copy on hand so that you can highlight and put notes on the assessment so that you can code it accurately before you take the test. By HICPICS. ACPCS is pronounced HICPIC. That is the Healthcare Common Procedure Coding System. So it's just a textbook for this chapter. When you get to this point, midway through Chapter 13, it's going to tell you that CPT coding is only one portion of a Part 2 coding system called HICPIX. So what you in what we're going to, going to be learning is that when you're dealing with procedure coding, you're going to be using both books, both manuals to identify your code. So the HICPIC is a collection of codes that represents procedures, supplies, products, and services that may be provided to care and Medicaid patients or what we consider beneficiaries because that's the term that you use for them. And sometimes private insurance companies will accept HICPIC codes generally is accepted nationally because there are some cases where you will not find a CPT code for the service and you must use the HICPIC code. So by CMS, which is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, it is formally known as the Healthcare Financing Administration. So that's why you see the first portion of the first initials considered healthcare common because it was a HICPIC system, coding system. And then 1983, the reason is because CPT codes did not contain all codes necessary for Medicare services reporting. A level of codes. You have three levels. Level one are considered CPT codes, which are all numerical. Level two are HICPICs. They are also known as national codes, and these are alphanumeric. And they're all five digits long. Level two has been phased out, but these were local, which means that your state could have a set of codes that was just local to the state Medicaid or state Blue Cross that what at one point could be used by different regions or different states. But that has been phased out and that is no longer active. What is telling us here is that level three local codes were developed by Medicare carriers for use at a local level, and they vary by locale. So if you were going to report a code in Michigan, you could not report the same code that meant the same thing in Nebraska. So that's why they were considered local codes. It discontinued December 31st of 2003, and some codes incorporated in the HICPIC Level 1 and Level 2. National codes, which are the ones that we're going to be learning about today, is that you're going to be coding from your HICPIC manual, and you should have it with you right now. It says on the front, 2012 HCPCS manual. They are codes for um, use for a variety of providers, physicians, dentists, dentists, 
are temporary codes there for Medicare. And temporary codes are codes that are maybe active for a year or two, but may be deactivated if a different code with more um, detailed definition of the code has been developed. So, national codes continuing on, it says codes for a variety of services, specific drugs, durable medical equipment, ambulance services, and a little bit because I wanted to talk about the drugs. A lot of the um, injectables that you will be coding, like 90% of your injectables that will be coding will be coming from your HCPCS manual. So that's something that you need to remember whenever you're trying to code for an injection that the patient has received for vitamins or therapeutic drugs or IV infusions. Just know that that will definitely be a HCPCS code. So it's a HCPCS um, guarantee because many payers require them. An increased, increased number of HIC, HICPIC codes, such as um, a new one has been added here, which is the J0585, which is a Botox injection. At one point, there were no codes available for Botox because it was used for mostly cosmetic use, but at the time changes. They have been using it for more medicinal uses, and we have a code for it. Format, it begins with a letter and is followed by four digits, but it's always considered a five-digit code because you're always going to consider the first digit as a digit, even if it's a letter. They here as considered an apnea monitor, but that basically means that it is an alphanumeric code. Each letter is a group, so they're grouped by letters. For instance, J codes are used to report drugs and dosages. You have H codes, you have A codes for durable medical equipment and things like that. So once you get used to coding for HICPICS, you're going to be um, just looking at what the letter of the code begins with. You're going to know what type of code it is. Certain letters like G, K, K, Q, S, H, and T, they indicate temporary codes, which means that they could change. Um, they could change, you know, description of them could change the next year. Codes are published every January, but it says here, but codes added, deleted, and revised throughout the year. So you can get um, bulletins from the insurance companies who accept HICPIC codes that give you a regular update like quarterly or monthly just to let you know or inform you that there have been some changes and some codes to replace other codes or codes to be um, used and have been deleted. So here's some information about coverage. It says just because items or services have HICPIC codes do not mean that it is covered. So this is where you need to look at your provider manuals more closely and check for that code that you have found to verify whether or not there is a payment indicated for it. So here's an example, V5130, which is a bit by, I hate saying, by neural hearing aid, which means a hearing aid for um, two sides of both ears. under Medicare for whatever reasons. Medicare may require a different type of hearing aid or a more cost-effective one. Where HICPIC codes are used, mostly outpatient settings, including outpatient departments inside of a hospital, and as level two, level one and two are used to report outpatient services to certain payers. Now remember, level one are PT codes. And it's quite confusing, but just know that all codes for procedures, procedure are considered HICPICs. And the both years, both, um, both levels, level one and level two, are used together to report all services that the, the provider has rendered.
So now about how to code. Take pics may as an index. It's in the front of the text and mostly in the front of the book. But a variety of publishers who create hick pick manuals and the one that you have from school um, you learn on could be different than the one that you work on. But know that when you get a new book, you always are going to check for where the index is. Sometimes it's in the back of the book, sometimes it's in the front. The books that you have issued by the school, 90% of the time the index is in the front. And with you, just like coding CPTs, you go to um, the main term, but never code directly from the index. You're going to reference your code, and you're going to re reference from the main portion text before assigning the code. So you may get a code range. You may get one code. You may get a code close to something that you're looking for. But you always have to go to that area of the coding book to verify which code you need to pick. It's doing CPT coding. Figure 13-22 of the textbook if you are using a 2012 textbook. It might be also the same if you're using a 2011, but I do not know the page number. This is what it looks like, the index. As you can see, it's, an alph it's alphabetized with bold font and a different color for the main term that you're searching for. And um, as you can see, some sub description uh, next to the description of the word or underneath that you're looking for. And it may give you one code or it may give you two codes or it may give you a code range. And what you do to narrow those down is you always check the code and compare it to the things that you actually need to find a CPT, well, I'm sorry, a HICPIC code for. And it's just like doing CPT. Coding. So, in the textbook, it tells us that the subterm of the index are listed under the main term to which they apply along with the code, just like we see here. As you can see, the index. Left hand and specific digits of the hand. 
left hand and you have um, right hand and right thumb as well as the digits of the feet. So these are fires that um, are, you know, specific to the hand and thumb, but the, um, there are some more modifiers here. But we have some T's that represents like the foot and the left hand. So it's just showing us right and left. But they'll have some specific modifiers for both sides of the body. And it's important to know that there are modifiers for specific body parts because you need to find that you're coding something that that um could possibly have issue if it's on the right side or the left side of the body. So if it's going to happen on the left foot or the left foot, right, um, you know, third digit, you want to make sure that you indicate that because if you build a procedure code again within the 90-day global period, the insurance company could misconstrue it for a duplicate and you would have to go back and file an appeal. So it's important to build it accurately the very first time. So here's more examples of body parts like left side and right side, LT and RT. And here's an example where it says right kidney biopsy. Here's the code and then the RT. And as you can see, this is a CPT code and a HICPIC modifier. And so you have information related to ambulance, like modifiers representing the flutter like represents the origin, the second digit represents, or the second letter represents the destination, and an example, R is resident, H is hospital, like R for um, residents, and H is hospital, like the ambulance has taken the patient to the resident, given right, or the, um, the ambulance patient to the hospital. If you use both of them together, which you, I'm sorry, if you use both letters, H, as you can see, R is the origin and H is the destination. So they took them from their residence. I'm, I'm sorry because I did kind of screw it up a little bit earlier. They taken their residence to their desk. They took them from the house to the hospital. And once you actually start working for certain companies, this will become second nature. It's not anything that you mainly need to memorize step by step while you're in class. The main things that you need to do is always refer to the chapter and look in the index of your chapter to verify or to find some additional information or find all of the chapters that cover that information so that you can code accurately and that you can have a better understanding. Of course, when you go to work, you're going to take your textbooks with you for the first two or three months until you get a good um, grip on what you're doing. Well, so inside of the Higgins Manual, we have what we consider a table of drugs. The table of drugs is similar to the one that you find in the ICD-9 manuals, except for these are indications or these indicate the medic medicine given to a patient, not the medicine and that the patient was poisoned by. So most of your medicines and injections will be coded from the table of drugs in the HICP manual for billing when a patient receives a shot. For instance, as you can see, the digoxin is a generic drug name. They have other names for digoxin, but if you don't know what the other name is, like linoxin and some other different names. You can always Google those names of the drugs and it may give you a variety of names if you can find the drug on the table. 99% of the time it's here, but it's under a different name. As you can see, which is up to 5 milligrams or 0.5 milligrams, and the route is intramuscular or IV, and here's your code. Now you can always verify your code throughout the main sections of the book, go over to the J's and find additional instructions. 
However, the main thing that you need to know is that you always make sure that you code the dosage accurately, meaning that if a person receives one milligram instead of 0.5, then you would build this procedure code times two, and that's the only thing you would need to do, or times three or times four or however many times you need to make sure that you code the um, the accurate amount for for this particular dosage. Now, there are times where you're going to find the code or the medicine listed twice, one up under the other, and it could be a higher dosage for that um, for that particular medicine. For instance, the digoxin here is per vial. And so if the patient was given a vial of it, then you'll just use this one code. So you always find that you're in the correct section. We're almost at the end, and then I'm going to go over the coding cases, and I'll be done. So here we're going to talk about durable medical equipment, and the acronym is DME. It is used for chronic disabling condition. Their Medicaid pay for some durable medical equipment items. Physicians must attest to need using certificate of medical necessity. Now this is some more information that you're going to learn about when you get into DME billing but the physician must have a um, document or a form completed on file, give history or write-up of the equipment that the patient needs and why the patient needs it. That must be on file at all times, and it's sometimes they're only valid for one year or six months, and then after that, Medicare or Medicaid may require a reevaluation. Then the patient will receive a prescription from the physician. The prescription could be for a wheelchair, a cane, a certain type of bed, or any other type of durable medical equipment that he does not give them in the office or they may not be able to pick it up directly from a pharmacy. What they would do at that time is they would contact a durable medical equipment company or the physician will refer them to one and the, inform and the information will be given to them about what the patient needs. And at that time, the delivery of the um, equipment will be given to the patient, and Medicare or Medicaid or both will start getting billed for the equipment. And, of course, the DME provider, which is someone for, um, will be billing, you know, on a monthly basis, some yearly but mostly monthly for um, the equipment that the patient is renting. So here's information of um, home oxygen therapy. It says Medicare may also pay for oxygen with certain medical conditions. Physicians must complete this form, which is known as the CMS-484, attesting to medical necessity. There are various types of uh, medical um, necessity forms or Certificates of medical necessity forms that the provider must complete and keep on file for the patient to qualify for DME. And of course, he, he has been in business for probably been in business for a long period of time. He should already know this. But if he's not doing it, then it is up to you as the biller or coder to ensure that he does this, or else you will never get paid, or a DME provider will never fill that, that you know order for the patient if you do not have a CMN, which is a Certificate of Medical Necessity, on file. Now we're moving on to breaking down coding cases. What you need to have in front of you is the weekly assessment, and of course what you need to do is go to weekly materials and click on week, which is week four, and go to reading materials and then download and or print pick up this assessment. Okay, I have here is five or six cases from this week's um, assessment. Over and it's gonna be very quick. So number one is three allergy injections. And it's with the provision of extract and professional service. So I'm asking for one code. I have the term, well, I added this in parentheses um, so that you can always know 
When you're dealing with allergy injections, and let me go to my little notes here. When you're dealing with allergy injections, what do you look for in the CPT index? Here, the main term is allergen, and the subterm is immunotherapy. And from there, uh, five, if there's anything else that you need to look for. There, you should find it. I think that's the only thing I needed to have written here for you guys to make sure. Of course, match up every other that makes, um, you know, that's specific to what it is that you're coding. For instance, the professional service, that may be a factor in determining the proper code. But if it isn't, then it doesn't matter. You just pick the, you know, pick the code. Okay, number two, it says replacement of contact lenses. Now, in parentheses, I put the word, um, the word contact lens height, but I put parentheses for that number one. And number two, the second thing, or the subterm, will be replacement. And in the index of the CPT manual, you should be able to find your code and go back, or code range and go back and search that. Okay, I found my notes for number one, and it has, here, what I wrote is that you have immunotherapy, and term would be allergen, okay, allergen, immunotherapy, and you have a subcategory or a subterm underneath, which is prescription, supply, injection, because allergy injection is basically a prescription of allergen or allergen meds that's given to the patient so that they can have their shots, and that's the, um, that should lead you to a code range. Once you search that range and view everything on the page, you should find a proper code because it indicates two or more injections were given. So that is your key term, those are your key words, and those are your clues. Okay, number three. We have number one, psychotherapy. The term number two would be the family in the index. And then the additional factors that determine the correct code would, would be without the patient present. And that's very simple. Make sure that order, number one, number two, and then we find the code range or code that it refers you to in the index. You need to make sure that you choose the code that's referencing to the one that's without the patient present. So number four, I don't have anything highlighted, but I think I'll highlight it now. Let me get my highlighter out. It says um, peritoneal dialysis with two repeated for an evaluation. So here the main term that we have, of course, is dialysis. The subterm or the type of dialysis that the patient had is peritoneal. The main two terms that you search for, you're going to be given a range. And once you review the code, you are, are going to verify that you pick the proper communicating repeated to repeat physician evaluation. And that's what you do is match up your terms. Once you get to matching up your terms and piecing it together like a puzzle, you should have no problem with coding. Number five, and then we have one more, and this will be over. So number five, what we have here is You can see here the first sentence tells us that the patient is in for follow up appointment status post mastectomy on two whatever the date is. Okay, so look at this. The patient has a status of post or previous mastectomy that has happened recently. Okay, so what we do is just code it as, as you can see here, a post op. The patient is following up from 
some complications due to the current surgery, and they are still in their 90-day global period. So at that case, you don't do anything. You won't hold it as an office visit or anything like that. You will call it as a post-operative visit. Okay, that's all you have to do. Okay, so number six. It says here, 50-year-old, I highlighted Medicare, patient clean for colorectal screening of the insulin. And so here are keywords, main terms, and clues. What happens? A screening. Medicare. So we're dealing with a HIC PIC code, all right, because it's a Medicare patient. So index, we're going to look for the word screening. And the type is colorectal, all right? And from there, you're going to be given a code or code range, and then it says the patient has a family history of colon cancer. So that is in this particular case with this particular HCPCS code. So once you're code, you make sure you match up all of your terms correctly. All or I'm sorry, all of your your clues and hints correctly, then you should find your code with no problem. So what I like to do is make sure that when you do your your code, that you always are going to start starting in that. And then you're always going to go back and verify your code. You never code from the index. Coding from the index is 9% um, of the time you're going to end up with the wrong code. Because especially with hit fit coding, on the page, on the index may just give you a similar code. But when you go over to that page and you read the code that's in that category or in that range up and down the page, you're going to find more definitive information that matches to the case that you're trying to code. And that's why it's always best to code directly from the main portions or the main sections of both CPT and HCPCS manuals. Okay, so that is it. Hopefully everything makes sense. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to give me a call. Thank you for watching.